to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, I got a new Eastman's Elevated podcast for you. So today I sit down with uh, successful bow hunter Tony Treach. Uh, just a really fun conversation with Tony. He, uh, he he just finds a way to be successful year after year on trophy critters, and, and it's fun to tap into that and uh, see similarities in the way we hunt and, and also differences. So we cover his uh, Colorado mule deer, which he just killed a giant this year with his bow, and, and we talk about his elk season, and, and then we get into – to hunt in Kansas, he just had an article in Eastman's about killing this world-class whitetail there in Kansas, and so we kind of talk about his, his his tactics there in Kansas and and getting permission from farmers and ranchers, and and he had a mule deer tag there this year and was able to harvest a really nice mule deer. But just a really fun conversation with Tony. He he trains and prepares nonstop. He's detail orientated, and, and then he sets aside enough time to make sure he's successful out west. So really fun to compare notes with him. You guys will enjoy today's show. Uh, sponsor for today's show is Matthews Bows. I've uh, been using Matthews for the last couple of years and really impressed with what they're coming out with. They just build such an accurate bow. It it, uh, it seems to almost shoot itself. It shoots such good groups. And I shot the Halon 7 and the Halon 6 and really impressed by those. And then this year they came out with their Tri-X. And I, I just got this bow, just have it set up and started firing arrows through it. I mean, this bow is going to be a shooter. It's a smaller axle-to-axle bow. It aims really good. I really Really like the draw cycle um, you know when you when you come back to full draw it's absolutely rock solid there against the back wall uh, just really impressed with it and it it seems to just shoot some some really tight groups so I'm going to use the Tri-X exclusively for 2018 for all my hunts um, and, and really excited about it and, and I just can't wait to work with this bow more and kind of fine-tune things in and get used to it and see what this thing will will do and and how it'll perform and and also I'm really impressed um, they've quieted this bow down quite a bit and, uh, you know, compounds always make a little noise when you shoot them, no matter which brand it is, but, um, uh, they've gone a, a step above everybody on the market now with, with the quietness of this, this bow. Uh, so really impressed with that. Um, they've got a bunch of vibration dampeners in it and have just done, designed the bow to, to absorb a lot of that sound. Um, but really impressed with how quiet this bow is. So, um, I don't think I'll have anything jump in my string in 2018. Um, but thanks to Matthews for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate their support. Uh, and go check them out, guys. I'm building a killer bow. Uh, over there at Eastman's, finally got my dates right. Uh, I'm going to go over there um, the 14th and 15th. Uh, we're going to go record some podcasts. Um, I've heard back from uh, Guy and Dan. I know you guys have heard me talking about uh, they, they went to – I'm going to get this wrong, but – to Jerkistan or one of the stands over there. I, uh, a foreign country to go hunt those Marco Polo sheep above 16,000 feet. I mean, Dan got altitude sickness over there, and, and that guy, he's in as good a shape as you can be in. Young, fit guy. He lives lives in the mountains. I mean, he, he, he belongs. He's home there. Uh, so for him to get altitude sickness is pretty wild. But, yeah, he was on death's door is how it was described to me. Uh, both of those guys lost a ton of weight. They got stuck in the airport. Uh, guy killed a bomber, Marco Polo. Uh, spoiler alert, but he killed a bomber, Marco Polo. And so uh, I just can't wait to get those guys on the podcast and talk about their adventure, as well as I'm going to sit down with Brandon Mason, who I always really enjoy talking to, uh, and also talk, talk some other guys into being on the podcast. I always like sitting down with Ike. That guy is just so fun to hang out with and and then I'm going to go to the to the Christmas party over there and bring my wife. So it's going to be a pretty cool deal. I'm really looking forward to it and looking forward to some of the recordings I'm going to going to get out to you guys. Uh, make sure that you check out uh, our gear guide. It came out in both the Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal and the Eastman's Hunting Journal. A uh, bunch of great gifts out there for hunters. And then the deal that caught my eye was buy three subscriptions for family or friends, and then you get a Sitka hoodie and an Outdoor Edge knife kit. It's like a oh, $120 value or 
150 I can't remember exactly but it's uh basically the Sitka hoodie you get and the outdoor edge knife kit is is worth more than the three subscriptions that you buy for family and friends so it's a no-brainer you you make out good you give subscriptions give a good gift that that people are going to enjoy and use and then uh, you also get a little Christmas gift for it too so pretty cool deal make sure to check that out and with that let's get this thing rolling so me and Tony Treach Eastman's Elevated here we go Okay, I'm here with Tony Treach. Um, super excited to talk to you, Tony. You had a heck of a season. Um, I saw a couple great muleys come by uh, on my social media feed and then a, a moose. Um, thanks for being on. Hey, thanks for having me, Brian. Man, what a season. Yeah, I saw you closed out. Um, looks like you had a, a Kansas tag, um, which is rare for a Kansas mule deer tag. Uh, us guys out west, we don't hear about that too often. No, that's that's good. We shouldn't talk about it either. I don't want anyone else to know. My odds are my odds are low enough to draw on that tag. <laughs> <laughs> they have some yeah, good muleys down there, though. It looks like. Yeah, I mean, you have to search pretty hard for them. It's all wide open terrains, and they get hammered pretty hard by uh, uh, by the locals. That you know, that the, you know, it's a lot easier for a resident to draw that tag, and and uh, the firearm season down there does a pretty good job on them, but. Uh, I would say in general, it's it's harder to find trophy quality down there, but uh, you know it it's it's easier to find a trophy whitetail. I, I, I guess would be the best way to put it than it is to find a trophy mule deer. Uh, but I was excited to draw it. I mean, I've been trying for years, and uh, you know if you look at the draw odds, I should have drawn a couple of them by now. But um, yeah, I can't complain. I got one this year, and it all worked out. So. Well, yeah, and, and whitetails. Uh, we were just talking before the podcast, and you've just shot some some bomber whitetails there out of Kansas. Uh, you got a good spot there. It seems like um, when I I uh, and you were just published in Eastman's for a giant whitetail you killed um, out there as well, right? Yep, yep. I decoyed him uh, one last year with the heads up decoy system and uh, kind of a rattling and and decoying uh, scenario. But there was I had three different mature bucks all around me at the same time and. He was the one buck that I didn't see coming, uh, and and the, probably the reason the other two bucks wouldn't come in. They would just they were on a stand up. They were just standing a couple hundred yards out there, looking at me like I'm not coming back in there. Um, and here he come up out of the bottom right behind me, and I literally didn't even, you know, I thought one of the bucks I was looking at was him. I and lo and behold, here he comes sneaking behind me. And if I hadn't turned around, I mean, he was already within range. But I turned around and saw him, and he had his ears pinned back and was, you know, he he was kind of had that head swaying back and forth almost like a, a running moose i mean he was he was coming and i had a decoy in my hand if i hadn't uh, turned around and saw him or heard him he might have uh might have taken the bow right out of my hand but it, it all worked out I, I was able to turn around and get an arrow through him and but yeah it's it you know it, it it's uh it's, it's a great place to hunt and i hopefully can go back there the rest of my life every year and spend some time with some great ranchers and it's uh you know it's it it reminds you of kind of like what you'd expect uh or what you'd want uh your neighbors to be like everybody down there you know if you if you're respectful and you you knock on doors they let you hunt still i mean it's and they know they know they can lease it off they could they could be getting big bucks every year to to have someone come in and and uh and have been you know out for the on the property but they don't want to it's the good people that just like like having uh, people hunt it, and they don't want to have the stress of having an outfitter in there, and, and it's lots of you know, it's not just one place. I've you know, I, it's 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 pretty easy to get. I, I've got a bunch of buddies that um, that are hey, let's go to Kansas, uh, and they want to come down. It's like man, just just go. I mean, it's it's not like I have a secret spot. I mean, I'm I'm bound, I don't I don't think I've killed a deer on the same farm maybe more than twice. I mean, I'm, these are all different spots. I'm just knocking on doors and trying to acquire a couple new spots every year. And I'm not the only one either. I mean, I'm running into other people that are hunting it. They're these people let lots of people hunt it. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's good people, good place. And I'm pretty fortunate to, I guess, have gotten that foot in the door the first time and then plan on keep going down as long as I can. Man, how cool. Um, yeah, it's like uh, learning those spots. It seems like the, the the first time is always the toughest going down and learning mm. new areas. And, and although I hunt a bunch of different units, it seems like always my first trip to that state – 
you know that that learning it and getting familiar with it and finding where you're going to hunt is always the toughest and then after that it seems like you can just build on the knowledge that you gain but yeah what an awesome buck sounds like you almost had to shoot him in self-defense uh, yeah oh yeah he, he never lifted <laughs> up his head once he saw that decoy i was able to turn around uh get situated draw i mean he he literally was looking down at the ground with his ears pinned back and i don't even think he looked up until i ground him to a stop at, you know in point blank range i, I don't know maybe it was, it was probably 20 yards but 25 maybe man but, how fun yeah, decoy, yeah decoy men like that you got to be prepared for a frontal um so i mean i'm pulling back you know a 72 pounds with a you know, with a turbo, Hoyt, you know, Hoyt turbo that's spitting them out there pretty hard and heavy arrow. So, I mean, I have no problem. I know I can get through, but they, when they come, uh, it's not like a, a doe decoy where they're going to sneak around and try to get behind her and sniff her. Uh, they're coming right at you. And that's, I've definitely found it's, it's exciting. Even, even, you know, even, even, I, even when I see bucks that I know I don't want to shoot, <laughs> I'll, I'll sometimes mess around with that decoy and just get them all riled up and they puff up like a, like a little Michelin era, like a, you know, whatever that little, uh, you know, like a marshmallow. They just, their hair stands up in the back of their neck and they, uh, they come in ready to go. It's pretty fun. Oh, so much fun. Well, and you talk about that front shot and that's something that's not talked about a lot in archery and that front shot is a great shot on animals it seems to me like it's just a a smaller window to hit and i love the the broadside or the quarter to way to tuck my arrow in there but i'll take that front shot and i've killed a lot of deer and antelope and even elk on that front shot but for me I like I need them closer. It's a it's, oh, yeah. there's yep. there's more room for air there and you've got to hit such a small spot and if you can stick that arrow right in that right spot, you're golden, but it seems like you can't miss too far. Or you're into no. the the edge of the shoulder and and me even with my setup and heavy arrows and and uh good kinetic energy, I just I can't get through that shoulder. I mean, every once in a while I will no. if I hit the right spot of it, but if I hit that shoulder, it doesn't get through, but um, that that frontal shot is a good shot. Like you just yeah. need to be close. Like for me, my limit, like usually I put it at about thirty yards or so. And thirty and yeah. in, I know I can hit that spot in the front, and that deer yep. won't make it out of sight. Is that the same thing yep. you run into? Oh, absolutely. Yep. And uh, you know, and I, and I've found the same thing too. I mean, even I'm, you know, I'm shooting a twenty nine inch draw and you know a five hundred and thirty green arrow and. 72 pounds. I mean, it, out of that turbo, it's it's cruising out there still at almost 280 feet per second, and it's and I've found that you know, it, you know, I, you aren't going. To, I hear people talking about punching through shoulders with their with their bows all the time. Well, maybe the shoulder blade, but you hit that knuckle like we were talking about that buck that I <laughs> the big one I didn't get a couple years ago, which unfortunately I hit him right in that knuckle. Uh, that knuckle, I don't think I don't. I've yet to see a bow with a broadhead that'll bust through the thick part of that knuckle up at the top of the shoulder. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a bow with a broadhead out there, but there's a small spot there. That's that bone where is that it's thickest is it, you know, the size of the shoulder blade. Yep. I, I've not poked through there, but you gotta, you gotta stay away from that. And, but yeah, you put it in front of their shoulder when they're coming at you like that aggressive, um, like that buck last year. I mean, my arrow was, sticking out his opposite hind quarter. It went through his whole body. Um, and I've done that where I've actually gotten pass throughs where I went from one quarter of the animal all the way through the other side. They they don't go far. It's it's over quick. Angles are good in archery, right? Anytime you get yeah. an angle on that body, that quartered away or even that quartering towards, and you got to mm-hmm. watch that quartering towards too because you almost right. don't want them quartering too hard at you. Let's see if I can say you You don't want them. Um, you want them almost dead on facing you or slightly quartered to you if they kind of right. angle more towards quartering towards you then you're aiming towards that shoulder and like you say that shoulder's a crapshoot and i'm a 27 inch draw but i just don't get through there very often and so i i try to stay away from that shoulder and i actually yeah. when i'm aiming at a broadside animal i never try to tuck that arrow really tight to that shoulder i always aim four inches off so that way yeah. I'm aiming at the middle of the lung. So if I miss towards the shoulder, I still get in and get heart and lungs. If I miss the other way, I get the liver, he still dies. But, yeah, that that shoulder is a bad deal. I try to stay away from that. But you you find that, too, on that quartering towards shot that you almost want him dead on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. if you can – yeah, that or just a a little bit of an angle. Um, You know, I – 
basically my, my theory always with whitetails was, and, I, and I've taken several, a lot, a lot of frontals. I mean, the ribs aren't much different in the front of the leg as they are behind the leg. If I can get it in this in whitetail's chest uh, and get through both lungs or a lung in his diaphragm, he's he's done. He's not going far. And especially as I've started hunting more from the ground. Um, I mean, I grew up a, a tree stand guy in the, in the Midwest, like like everybody out you know in the Midwest. And uh, as I as I've gravitated towards you know, spot and stalk, uh, you know, in, in the open plains for my white tails, my it, it's, 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 it's easier because I don't have the angles. Uh, the angle of shooting from the tree stand is a, is a different thing. I've, I've seen deer with one lung shot with a bow, uh, that lived. I mean, we saw him the next year. We know he, we know he lived. I know I saw, you know, I know where the arrow went. Um, but when you're on the ground and it's, and it's a level or a little more level, um, it, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit better. Uh, of course, you run into mountains where it's you got steep angles too, but uh, it's yeah. It, stay away from the shoulder if I can get a, it. You know, elk are different. You know, obviously it's a, a much bigger animal, and I got a little more. You know, maybe I don't want to say precise. I always try to be precise, but with deer, I know if I can get an arrow through that chest cavity, it's gonna die. Yeah, I'm the I'm the same way. Deer and antelope. If I can get it through that chest cavity, I I never really thought about that from a tree stand. But you're right, shooting from that that up angle, trying to get through that front would be really tough to get it centered through that body the way you want it. That's got to be a tough shot to make. But and, and with you there on elk, you know, I I I maybe killed one in the front there, but um I I like to wait for that quartering away or that broadside to put it in them. Yep. Elk are just such tough animals and so are deer, white tails and muleys, but elk are just so tough that it just seems like you you have to put a perfect shot on them or you don't get them. They're you, you can't just put one through the chest and and uh, hope for the best because one lung they can go forever. Guts they can go forever. They're just such a tough yep. animal and there's so much there and your broadhead cuts so little. Um, it just seems like you need an absolute perfect shot on elk or or you don't get them yeah i've definitely been more cautious with them and it's all worked out but i'm still sore from uh from from failing so miserably this year on my elk hunt so i i I think everything went wrong that could uh and i haven't found new and you know uh new ways to to screw up my elk hunt this year (laughs) but uh, I keep blaming it on my moose tag. I figure I can I can just say I was uh, I was thinking about my moose tag and planning on that. And yeah, that was, that was a gorgeous shiris that you were able to harvest there, and and you've been really successful on elk. I know I uh, I think we were talking earlier that you've killed them uh, the last four or five years that you've hunted them. Yeah, you know I've gotten one or two uh, every year of of I've hunted elk. Uh, you know, being you know a guy that started going out west later in life. Uh, which man, I tell all my young friends that are hunters, you gotta you gotta start while you're young. You know, it's 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 definitely a lot easier uh, on the body. But uh, so I started later in life, and I didn't. Uh, but every year I've went out there, I've gotten yeah you know, one or two, except for except for this year. But and you know, I have plenty of opportunities, and I passed up a bunch of bulls that are, you know, even you know bigger than maybe some that I've shot. Uh, but just because I, as I get to know the area better, and it's just an over the counter unit in Colorado that I can hunt every year. Uh, but I mean, I was on some some big bulls and plenty of mature ones, and I found uh, ways to screw up pretty much every one of them. Some of them more than once, so they uh, they're still out there. And there's some little ones that I passed up that hopefully made it through. That they were legal bulls uh, that uh, hopefully hopefully will make it through. But. Yeah, I like your advice telling guys to come out young, you know, being in good shape, and you prepare all year long, but uh, being in good good shape is key, but also that learning curve of coming out west and learning these different species and different units and, and uh, you know, adapting your, your tactics to fit this, this western style of hunting, that that takes years to, to evolve into uh, being successful year after year as well. Oh, absolutely, and, and man... For from a from a guy who grew up hunting tree stands, I was I don't even man my my uh, I've the length the last time I killed a buck in my home state was 2012 uh, and and then it was a good 130 inch deer which is great deer for around here whitetail, um, but 
even he was from the ground. I just, I, I'm not the most patient person. It is definitely my biggest flaw in hunting. And I, uh, for me to, you know, I, I can't even count the number of days that I've spent from well before sunup to after dark in the tree and never left. Uh, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of days over my life, maybe getting close to four digits. I mean, every single year. And it's just, I, I am, yeah, I, I wish I'd have started, I wish I'd have came out west, you know, 20 years ago and when I was just a little guy and, and, uh, and, and started because it, it really fits me. I'm, uh, to be mobile, to, you know, and to, to be able to cover the ground, to, to glass, you know, it's just things you don't do in the Midwest. Um, you know, most guys here don't even carry binoculars around their neck. So you know, it's, it's, uh, it fits me and, uh, I, I don't, you know, it's been years since I hunted Illinois or Ohio and, uh, you know, in Iowa, the states I used to go to, and I'm completely content. Uh, found a new home. I'm with you. West is where I belong to, and, and uh, I did my first um, tree stand hunt this season in Ohio with a buddy, and, um, yeah, it was good. It was a good lesson in, in patience, um, but I, it just makes me realize how much I, I love and appreciate the Western style of hunting and how much fun it is. Um, mm-hmm. But you still have to have extreme amounts of patience, and the more patience you have on the ground, the better you'll do, um, like you found out like on your elk hunt when we were talking yeah. earlier, or any hunting and any hunter, you know, I find myself too, um, you know, is, is usually when I fail or when I make a mistake, it, it was because I didn't have enough patience. Yeah. It's funny, you know, looking back at, at all the mistakes, and I, I think I told you the other day, I, like, the new mistakes that I, I remember, new ones that I made this fall, uh, like every day, I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot, yeah, I screwed that up too. But most of them I can look back at, and most of them are either, you know, moving too fast through an area where I probably shouldn't have or being too aggressive, um, which has paid off in most years. But, you know, I just, I needed, I, you know, looking back, if I had to dial it down just a little bit, uh, you know, I think I think things would have probably panned out a little bit better. But and I also had times where I just there was nothing I could do. I mean, there was I had bulls ten feet away from me on the other side of you know a couple of trees that just stood there screaming at me, and he wouldn't make another step. And you name it, I, I you name you name it the way of messing up uh, an elk hunt, and I did it this year. So, but. <laughs> well, well, we always l- learn way more from our failures than we do our successes, and it it's a good motivator too. It keeps you working hard all year round to go test your skills and and make sure you're ready for next year. But yeah, elk are a funny one, and I I find a lot of motivation from from elk hunting year to year, and I've I've killed a nice six point. Uh, I, I don't even know how many years in a row now, but um, gosh, you're just always looking for that next level and, and next season and do a little bit better. But elk are tricky ones because you do need to be aggressive. And, and like you talked about, you've been successful being aggressive, but it's this mm-hmm. fine line between being aggressive with them and, and then also being patient and waiting for your chance to move in. And I, I struggle with that with elk as well. And, and I, you know, I... I can remember back at a lot of the mistakes at, at the bigger bulls that I've messed up on, and, and uh, yeah, it was lack of patience. Um, mm. You know, I, I I can remember th- what comes clearly in my mind is like these mistakes I've made where I'm chasing a bull and he's bugling, and you got to keep with him and kind of coyote him until he starts to settle down and you can get a play on him or you catch up to him. And it seems like they feed around right before they bed, and that's a great chance to kill a bull. But So I've, I coyoted this... this and there's been a couple scenarios where this has happened, but I remember this one great big bull that I was coyoting, and and uh, he was bugling, and every time I'd hear him bugle, and then I'd move a little bit closer, and then bugle. But you got to know when to slow down. Like you you move at a good clip to keep with him, but then you got to know when to slow your footfalls when you're in the hunt, and it's. Like, that's the toughest thing about elk hunting. And this bull, I remember, I was starting to get close, and I was slowing down. And then I heard him bugle again, and I could tell he was off, you know, five, six, seven hundred yards. It's time to cover country and catch back up to him. And so I went scrambling over the hill, and uh, he was right over top of that hill. And I walked pretty much into bow range of him, but I wasn't moving slow enough where all the elk caught me. You know, I tried to get drawn, and he blew up. And, and what had happened was is that bull had bugled facing away from from me and it echoed uh-huh. off the far canyon wall and so it made me think he was farther than he was and i 
I've messed up a couple times like that on, on big bowls that I thought were in a different spot and come over the hill and then, you know, you're caught with your pants down. You're right on top of them and they see you when you see them. But, man, oh, those, I, those elk are tough. Yeah, that's happened a few times to me, too, I, I, where I, you know, thought they were a lot further away. And then next thing you know, I got a cow on each side of me, you know, barking and he stands up and he's only, you know, 50 yards away. It's like, oh, man, I could just slow down. <laughs> But but you can't still hunt through everything. You can't still yeah. hunt through all that timber. Like you 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 can also have the opposite happen where you know you're not aggressive enough following a bull and he gets away from you and then yeah. you don't know where he went and you can't even hunt him that day because he he disappeared and you didn't keep with him. And so man, it's like this 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 balance <laughs> between being patient and being aggressive. And I I think it just comes down to experience and experience shapes your instincts on elk and and knowing when to push hard knowing when to back off and you have a season like you had where you should have had more patience in a lot of scenarios well that's going to make you more patient next season but yeah. i think it all comes down to the those instincts and experiences you know to try to capitalize on those on a, on a big bull yeah yeah I, next year is going to be a uh, elk redemption for sure i i, I don't uh it seems like the the unit i usually draw in colorado is uh where it used to be I could draw it every year. Now it looks like it's every other year uh, for the most part. So I'll probably try to focus on – I might actually burn my points that I have. I have, I don't know, five, six, seven points for elk in Colorado, and uh, I've never hunted anything except for over-the-counter units in Colorado. So I might actually try to give that a shot this year and um, and hunt uh, Wyoming and probably Idaho this year too, this next year. So. Oh, good for you. I can't wait for – tag season and, and oh. <laughs> uh, to, to start thinking and researching and applying and yeah i've got huge plans for next year too yeah I, I didn't draw any high country mule deer tag this year and so i ended up i went to idaho and had a great hunt there in the high country but uh next year i've, I've got a a good build of points for for hunting colorado and uh, nevada and utah and so uh, i'm not sure where i'm gonna head yet but yeah elk's always on my mind as well i always want to try to harvest a good bull and i've never had a a premium tag i've always just uh done montana over the counter general season but um i i sure like chasing those big ones and i i really like to kill a 350 bull with my bow i i've got quite a few in that 320 to 350 range but i'm yet to to break that 350 uh with my bow and so um yeah and it's like i've had a couple years where i've held out and then you pass opportunities at those good 320 330 bulls and you never yeah. end up getting one and eat your tag and you go next year i'm hunting you know any bull that's over 320 i'm, I'm taking you know but uh yeah i uh you, you just can't kill those giant ones without passing the you know and a 320 is a giant bull to me on public ground but you know yeah. to kill that next level bull you're gonna have to pass some good ones that's for sure yeah that goes for everything you know I, and uh, i've got a bunch of buddies that you know i show them pictures of the the deer that i that i passed up or, or didn't even make a stock on just you know, I got lots of pictures of, you know, smaller bucks from Colorado or Utah or Kansas, wherever that I was at, that uh, it's like, well, yeah, they're like, wow, that's a great buck. I'm like, yeah, I didn't even, you know, we just I just moved to the next basin and kept glassing. And then they look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, listen, you're not going to, you're never going to shoot a 180-inch plus buck if you shoot every 165-inch buck you see. It's just, I mean, it's, it's not going to happen. You have to make a choice. Um, you know, are you okay going to the end of the hunt and not shooting anything? Or do you need to kill something? If you just need a buck and want to just have that experience, well then, go ahead. If you're happy with 165 inches, go for it. But you know, it's 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 you gotta you gotta be happy with what what you do, what you, what you take. The the worst feeling in the world is you know to and you know and disrespectful to the animal too to you know to to kill it and then be like oh crap you know that's not that's not what I thought it was or like yeah i wish he was bigger he just that's that's a horrible feeling i don't ever want to have again i mean you know it's been years since i've had it and i don't don't want it so um I, i've said it before to to somebody but i lots of people probably but someone pretty wise told me once that you know if there's any any hesitation at all if you see an animal you're like mm, if you have to think about it at all pass on it if it's because that you know, unless unless you just something, all of a sudden you see something you didn't see at first. But if you get a good look at it and it's a, it's not a no brainer, then then that's not an animal that's gonna make you happy. And uh, you know, for me it's old old bucks with character. You know, they don't have to be they don't have to score big. I'm not a I'm not a you know I don't 
I don't like give a crap about score. I've got, I don't know how many booners and Pope and young animals. I've never entered a single one. I love those organizations. I love what they do for us as hunters, but I've never entered a deer or anything, an animal in any of the books. I don't, that's not important to me. I, I don't even put a tape on half of them, but I just want an old mature animal. And if they've got character, I mean, I've shot bucks are probably only four years old, but you know, you show me a thick bases and gnarly brow tines and extra points coming off the bill. Oh, it's that's game on. I, I'm, you know, those, <laughs> those things trip my trigger and you just got to be happy with what you take. And, and, uh, yeah, everybody's got a different, you know, set of standards and yeah, um, as long as you're happy. I'm with you. I love those mature ones, but, but you're right. You definitely have to be happy with what you harvest. And, and I'm like you, I just want, I want them to be heavy and mature, but you know, your expectations has to, has to match like the, the place you're hunting as well. You have to have opportunities. If you never see a 200 inch deer in your unit, then it's, it's going to be really tough for you to set your goal to 200 inch deer and not be happy with anything but. And so your expectations definitely have to match the unit you're in. And I also think sometimes with today's day and age and, and social media, you know, I, I think guys get caught up in trying to kill too big a critter sometimes. Like I think you got to work your way up the trophy ladder for me. Like I've got a, I've got to harvest a four point before I can pass a four point or I've got to harvest you know, 170 inch deer before I can pass 170 inch deer. It, at least that's the way I've always gone uh, gone about it, you know. And and, and so you kind of got to work your way up and and get a few of those harvests and uh, under your belt, prove to yourself you can do it, and then you keep setting your goals a little bit higher and a little bit higher where they're achievable and you know you can achieve them. Where where I see some guys, you know, they they set their their standards and their goals too high and end up going home empty handed and don't have a good experience. I mean, the fun of bow hunting is bow hunting. It's making stocks and making plays. And so I, I get caught up in that as well. And I love killing trophy critters, but I also love to make stocks and love to make plays. And so for me, I look for a buck that I'm going to be happy with. And and like if I'm going to Colorado, I know 200 inchers live there. I've seen them, you know. And so I can go to a place like that and I've harvested enough deer and i know that's such a good chance for me to harvest a giant buck and so i can hold out for a giant buck and if i don't kill a deer or i don't make a stock i know that i'm gonna spend the entirety of that hunt getting this awesome experience looking for that next level buck trying to make a play at him at least that's the way i've always looked at it oh did i lose you tony hey there tony Yo, now now you're crystal clear. Yes, as soon as I got done talking, it was I could hear I could barely hear you, and it was it was uh, really broke up. Oh, that dang internet! It'll get you. Uh, well, no big deal. We'll get it edited together. But yeah, I was just saying. Okay. Um, I had a couple different thoughts there, but um, you know, I, I think um, you know your 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 goals need to and your expectations need to match the unit that you're hunting. You know, if the if you've never seen a a 200 inch deer in there it's tough to set your goal at 200 inch deer you know and so <laughs> right. it, it des- definitely has to match up and then you know i also think um in today's day and age with with the social media i think guys get caught up in a little too much in big critters and may hold out for big critters before they've ever harvested them or honed their skills to be able to to kill a critter like that and so i always like to work my way up the trophy ladder like yeah for me i have to kill a four point before i can pass a four point or i've got to harvest a 170 inch deer before i can pass a 170 inch deer and that way i'm getting all that experience honing my skills so when i do get that opportunity because you definitely get less opportunities at 200 inch deer than you do 170 inch deer so when you get those those opportunities you know you can make good on them and and harvest yeah. that critter and so i like to work my way up is that how you've done it out west oh yeah no yeah i my first year out i would i mean well i got I, it might be a little bit different for me because i grew up uh we were meat you know we were meat hunters growing up and i mean i've got a pile of antlers from bucks that <laughs> you know basically in michigan northern michigan if you saw uh if you saw antlers before our antler restrictions went into effect you i mean you were you were lucky just to see a buck so um it wasn't until i was my my early 20s where i started traveling to places like illinois and iowa and even realized holy cow there's other states out there where there's just mature deer there's deer that are allowed to get to an age where they're 
they're not, you know, they're not, they're not just spikes and fork horns. <laughs> so by the time I started going out west, I had, I had been hunting the Midwest a lot in Kansas a lot, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely, uh, I, 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 maybe it wasn't holding up for what I do now, but I mean, I was still holding up for something mature. Um, and I think that I, I, I do see what you're talking about with, you know, I, people see. You know, no one posts. Well, I shouldn't say no one, but not, not, you don't see as many posts uh, on social media of say year and a year and a half old deer or two and a half year old deer. You know, hundred inch whitetails. And so people that are just new to hunting, they think that well, they you know they'll you got to kill a big buck or just nothing. And man, you're you're not going to get good at what you do if if you're holding out for five and a half year old plus deer and you haven't put a whole lot of deer on the ground before. You've you've got to learn how to get the job done before you. You know, before you start uh, just trying to take mature animals, you know, figure out you can make plenty of mistakes on young deer and, and or young elk or whatever. Just you got to you got to figure out how, how things work before you really start, you know, raising the bar and setting your standards that high. I think you're just setting yourself up for failure and you're, you're setting yourself up to be disappointed. Oh, you're so right. So you got a bunch of experience in the Midwest executing shots, uh, uh, being able to get ranges, uh, and being successful on deer. And so you're able to get that uh, experience and that confidence. So when you came out west, you know, you were looking for a mature mule deer or mature elk or mm-hmm. whatever it was you were looking for. But you, you had that background, that experience where you had harvested and you had confidence in your skills. And I, th- I think that's key. I think for new bow hunters, you have have to work your way up that trophy ladder and you're yeah you're your first year out you know your goal should be to harvest a deer you know and then you can start working your way up and i know yeah. just like you i've had a, a a bunch of my experience hunting antelope and younger bulls and younger bucks and and hunting does i hunt a lot of white tail does we get a lot of tags out here as we've got uh, a really high population in our river bottoms but but that experience for me has been key to me harvesting giant deer and giant bulls it, it's yeah. just that experience of, of knowing how to execute yeah you take an old matriarch doe that's that's eight years old that is that is a very intelligent animal that usually all the other deer are watching and queuing off her if you can spot and stock up an eight-year-old doe <laughs> you're gonna have you're gonna have good luck on mature bucks that you gotta you gotta there's lots of there's lots of ways to practice and and uh kind of up get your game up to, to level before you expect the you know the results of killing a mature buck every year it's there's, there's lots of ways to do it and yeah I, I love i love shooting does too it's, it's the same thing around here their uh doe tags are plentiful and uh, i got lots of friends that live off the meat so it's good time yeah well and i um you know our our craft of this this western spot and stock style hunting um you know back w- w- just a a few minutes ago when we were talking elk and talking um talking instincts and talking experience well that more the more experience you can get stalking animals and and uh you get switched on to to their movements and what they're paying attention to and your approaches and the more you can do that the better you get at it and the you know and your 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 level of expertise raises to where then you can target those giant deer that are that are older and like you say you can hold out because you don't need as many chances to harvest them because you're going to get yeah. it right when you with very few opportunities be because your experience is is uh so high you know because your instincts are so good on that spot and stock game so i i just think that the more you can do it and, and the the more you can be successful the higher your confidence grows and the you know the the larger animals you're going to harvest in the future yeah, absolutely. There's there's something to be said about having uh, that killer instinct, and, and I've got friends that are good shots with an arrow, and uh, I've got friends that aren't. And well, my dad's one of the, my dad's a perfect example. I mean, he is not prof- he's not proficient with a bow or a gun. <laughs> he's just not a good <laughs> shot. But he has his whole life is. I mean, he's that guy that you know we're tracking a deer and it jumps up 100 yards away through the timber. And before I can even, you know, get my gun up, it's it's dead. Like he shot it running. I mean, but he but shoot, ask him to shoot a pie plate at 75 yards, he might he might miss it. Um, so there's that there's that instinct part that's so important. But like you're saying, with practice and more more stocks on 
you know, just getting out there and doing it more often, not holding out for a monster belt. Just, just get out there and do it. You, you hone a skill set too that when you, when you've got that skill set and you've got the instincts to go to with it too, you know, and you, and you've done it. You've been there. You've, you've, you've put your time in and you've taken, uh, you know, you've taken plenty of animals to get to the point where you're like, all right, now I, you know, you, I, it's, it's almost a waste to, 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 hold up that big animal if you don't know what you're going to do when you get there it's you know you um you get put in a lot of time for probably probably some disappointment and some failure but, and i think it's good to miss or to mix those uh high opportunity hunts you know along with those trophy hunts like i know even me like i i like to get those you, you know the the stocks under my belt, and it it just seems like it it takes me a little bit to be hitting on all cylinders and be picking up on all the signs and making the right moves. But I know I like to mix those high opportunity hunts because an elk hunt, you know, it, it depends on where you're hunting and and how many chances you have. But you might only get a couple stocks a season, or a mature mule deer, you might only get a couple stocks a year. And and you know if it's good, you may get more than that. But like an antelope hunt, you may get three to five stocks a day. And so if you can mix some of those other hunts like the doe hunts that we talked about or you know an antelope hunt where you're just making plays and you're out there and hunting those do so much for for your skill set you know and so i like to mix a lot of those hunts with my trophy hunts um every season that i'm hunting yeah absolutely no i i I agree 100 percent you know like in colorado where i was at this year i actually you know it's not really known for a trophy as a trophy area. It's got pretty good numbers and I blew it on the first day on on the buck that I had found, uh, or one of the bucks that I, you know, I'd found, uh, but I was able to find another one pretty quick, uh, and get on him on the second day and and made it happen. But you take like Kansas where I just came from. And that was the only, that was the only shooter I found, uh, in my hunting, uh, in, in glass and scouting. And I covered a lot of ground. Um, I found a couple of old, Mature animals that, you know, you know, they were definitely, one of them passed his prime and they were, they were, they've been good bucks to, to kill. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's just not what I wanted to take. But I mean, yeah, I only found one that really, one no brainer, I guess you'd say, you know, one that was like, yep, that's, that's what I want to, that's what I want to kill. So, you know, if I'd have blown him out and that hadn't worked, um, you know, who knows how much longer I'd have been down there. Um, so you never know, but oh, that was a a bomber buck you killed in Colorado, Tony. That was a really nice looking mule deer. You talk about character and old. Like I yeah. think he had like three and a and a cheater off one side or something, but real yeah. bladed, heavy tines. He looked really wide too. Um, yeah. that was a great buck, Tony. Congratulations on that one. Thanks. Yeah, no, he's he's wide. His main beams are crazy long and curl up, and uh, doesn't really have any back forks to speak of. Just a couple kickers, and then I think he's got a fork G4. I mean, yeah, he's he's got a giant frame. Like you know, he's he's definitely got a 200 inch frame. If he did it, if he'd have grew, you know, if he had big forks in the back or you know 10 inch forks in the back, uh, he'd have, he'd have been pushing 200 inches. So. Oh, um, I'll shoot that yeah. buck every year. That was a great oh, yeah. looking buck, man. That was an awesome deer. Um, yeah. So, so good for you. So you blew it the first day. Had a stock <laughs> on a buck. Like they're just gonna win sometimes, right? And I find oh, yeah. giant bucks, and I'll travel for days looking for a two hundred inch deer or a big mature one like the one you killed. But it's not always a given you're gonna get it done. Sometimes you no. you hit that low of bow hunting where you blow a stock or something happens, and then you're you're on the search again. Oh yeah, well, I was on the search again because. It's weird, you know. I left, I left Michigan uh, like August 9th or 10th and headed out west because I had an early uh, archery tag in Utah. But I wanted to stop in Colorado and scout before I got there. And I found a great buck. I was there for four days. Um, found a, you know, what I figured he was close to mid 190s, beautiful buck. And found some other decent bucks, but I mean, he was by far the best one. And I was literally the night, you know, I went into town, got cleaned up, getting some food, getting ready to head over to Utah so I could have three or four days to scout there before it started. And I'm flipping through Instagram and I'm not kidding. Someone that I follow and he follows me and he's a nice guy. We've, we messaged back and forth. Seems like good, good dude. He had a picture of that deer in the same bed that I left him on the last day. <laughs> and I almost spit up my dinner at, at, the, at the, at the table. I could not believe it. Um, you know, I talked to, 
you know some guys uh, that I respect about it, and I you know like gosh, what do I do? You know, I don't want I don't want to combat combat hunt. It's what I grew up doing in Michigan. It's no fun. Um, and I and I didn't really have a good plan B. So I the whole time I was over in Utah, I had that in the back of my mind, and um, I only I, I hunted for four days before I, I got back. I want I gave myself an extra day and a half back in Colorado before the opener to find some more shooters. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, cause I knew they were coming in with at least three or four guys and, uh, that group, you know, that found them like, you know, I, I'll just let them have it. It's, it's not worth it. I, you know, I'm up there for the experience and it's, the, you know, it's, I don't want to have to be worrying about what another hunter's doing off the get go on opening day or the day before as I'm setting up, you know, it's, so I found some other bucks Sure enough, I found other people looking at them too, and uh, but uh, it was gonna be pretty tough to get where they were at. And I actually talked to those guys, and they had some other bucks they were located at. And I basically told them like, where I was gonna be, and and uh, you know we could probably both hunt them, but um, you know we you know, we could come up from different sides and see what they do. And but those guys found other bucks, and I got above those deer uh, opening or the day before, you know night before opener, and they were still there, and uh, along with a ton of bears. I've never seen so many bears uh, in any area. I think I saw 18 bears in Colorado this year while I was there. And seven of them I saw opening day. Uh, and they kept bumping the deer. Opening morning I found them, the bucks, uh, or one of the two anyways, that that uh, in that basin that I, I wanted. Real heavy, thick, uh, not real wide at all, but just heavy, tall, uh, in line in between his back forks. Just gorgeous buck, real unique looking. Um, probably wouldn't score with a squat, but you know, 300 plus body and just just a big, thick old deer. And uh, he would lay down, and I would start moving in, <laughs> and and uh, you know, it's just in willow, so I can see him when he gets up. And sure enough, I mean, seven bears I saw in this basin opening day, and they would bump. They, he got bumped by them probably three times and he'd get up and move and I'd shift and he'd move and I'd shift and this went on from nine o'clock in the morning until you know half hour 45 minutes before dark and they finally came out and uh caught me off guard you know they, I was you know you're sitting there waiting 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 forever for him to stand up and then when you didn't you turn around and he's already stood up and he's took 10 steps and he's staring at you and you're like no and uh you know it was that standoff with me crouched down and sure enough he uh he kind of did the, I'm going to look away, and as soon as he did, I, I drew him. He was well within my first pin distance, and uh, I was too close, actually. And, uh, it's, you know, he whipped his head around as soon as I started drawing. He ended up bouncing out to, like, 65 yards. I, and he stopped. I rearranged him. I dialed in uh, pin, and uh, it's probably the main reason I'm going to be getting a new uh, range finder this year, my <laughs> my uh I've, I've found it sometimes it doesn't it doesn't adjust enough in the super steep uh, in, when I'm out in the mountains and it's really really steep grade I have to add about 10 percent to uh, for my arrow to hit where I'm, you know where, you know the range finder adjusts for it but it's it's not enough it's, when, it's, once got, it's got angle compensating but it's off it, by 10 percent I had a range oh, finder yeah. like that too I know what you're talking about and, and I and I and I and I, and I, and I, and I mean, the, the shot felt great he stood there and that arrow just zipped right over his uh you know, his shoulders. And uh, I watched him bounce away. And meanwhile, there was a 400 pound black bear that was 300 yards, well, not even 300, probably 200 yards down, downhill of him. I, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, if I do hit him, he's going to roll right down to that bear. And <laughs> I'm going to have to figure out how to deal with that. But yeah, so he, I blew them out of that basin. That was fantastic. But I had seen him while I was up there. I, I could glass forever. And uh, I picked up a couple of our bucks about two miles away that. You know, at that distance, I could, I just, I had the 65 millimeter uh, Swarovski, and I, I could tell he was, he was, they were good bucks, they were mature. That's all I could tell. I really, you know, I, uh, I'm not counting points at two, two, two and a half miles, but so next morning gave them another chance to come back in that basin. They didn't, so I hiked out and immediately went over to the other basin on the other side and went up into that area. And uh, it's funny, I didn't actually make it to where he was. Um, you know, I, I was probably a mile from where I saw them, you know, the, the two previous days and that morning. And uh, I look up, you know, kind of a, in a different direction. It's in the, the next basin over, basically. I was coming from the side, and there's a deer standing underneath some cliffs in the sun. And it's like, I don't know, it's probably 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. 
and there's no clouds. I mean, he's just getting beat by the sun. He's standing up underneath these rocks panting. And I've got video of it on my Instagram and stuff. But he's just standing there in the willows underneath this cliff panting, tongue hanging out of his mouth. And I think what happened, I think someone else saw him that morning or maybe after I, you know, uh, after I saw him, maybe someone put him to you know, bed and then snuck in and blew him up because he was uh, he had moved. And I just got lucky finding him. Um, I hadn't even made it up to where they were. And uh so he's standing out there panting, and I, I watched him for the longest time, and he'd lay down for a second, he'd get back up, and he'd lay down for a second, he'd get back up. Well, eventually he moves to the bottom of the basin where there's there's no willows, there's no you know there's there's no there's no real structure for him to hide me around except for giant boulders that have ro- you know rolled all the way down uh, from the high high cliffs, and sure enough he beds behind one, but in the sun on the sunny side, I couldn't believe he's on the southwest side of this rock which is on the side I'm on, so I can't just walk. You know, if he'd have been on the other side, it would have been a piece of cake. I could just walk right at him. There was a quartering wind. He wouldn't have been looking my way. It would have just been just perfect. But sure enough, he beds on my side of the rock in the sun still. I don't know what the heck he, you know, he did not act like a mature buck in that manner. He never looked for shade. And uh, But there was a there was an old dry creek bed uh, filled with those boulders that was, you know, it was only probably two foot, to a, sometimes only six inches deep that one you know wound its way up that basin and, and to him I mean, he's probably 500 yards away you know at that point and i just started crawling up the the, the creek bed and you know he could see me if he'd looked but there was enough little boulders out there i think i kind of blended in with them and I, when i could i'd try to position one of them in between us and i'd walk up as far as i could to, to that boulder and then kind of look for the next one and just pick my way up through that area on my hands and knees and uh the last you know, boulder, maybe like a, it wasn't big enough to hide my whole body, but it definitely broke me up enough. It was maybe, you know, a little bit bigger than a microwave, uh, standing on end. And I just got right behind it. I was about, about 75, 77 yards. I think he was. And there I waited in the sun too. I really wish he would have been in the shade because then I couldn't, wouldn't have to sit there and bake for, for three hours. But, um, it, it was probably two or three hours. I'm sitting there behind that rock on my knees, crunched down. And there just happened to be another rock that was maybe like the size of a softball, maybe a little bit bigger, maybe like volleyball size, uh, underneath my right knee. And, you know, it's kind of grassy there. And I, after a few, you know, right away, it didn't hurt much at all. Uh, I had the knee pads in the Sitka. I think I had my mountain pants on that day. And they really helped quite a bit with the, you know, crawling in there and then kneeling on that rock. But after a while, I'm like, I got to get rid of this rock. This thing's driving me crazy. And, you know, you're going through all those scenarios. Okay, if he stands up, am I going to get, am I going to lean out over this side of the rock? Am I going to lean out over this side of the rock? I'm like, this rock's just going to be a problem. This lower, this little one. I even have enough to, do, to deal with thinking about getting an arrow through him. So I'm like, I'm getting rid of this rock. I'm back off a little bit. You know, and I'm, all this whole time, I'm trying to hide behind a rock that's, you know, the size of my torso. And I pull it up and I roll it off to the side and instantly, I didn't even think about this, but there was a nest of ants underneath that rock, like thousands of them. <laughs> they're crawling up my legs. They're on my arms. I'm slowly trying to squash them all because they're just, you know, I'm picking them out of my hair, biting me. You know, they, oh, I was covered in, you know, thank God they weren't like fire ants or something. They really had a bad bite. They were just little black ants, but I was just covered with them. I'm thinking, this buck, I better get this thing because this is this is like torture. I'm, I'm literally being eaten alive by these ants defending their home because I just rolled this rock. I've been sitting here for 5,000 years. Uh, and so eventually get get them taken care of, and he decides to stand up, and it was, uh, you know, it's, it's nice when, when they don't know you're there, and they just stand up, and they stretch, and, you know, and I, I took my time. I knew I had plenty of time and um, made a good shot, uh, you know, being a Midwest guy that hunted with his whitetails his whole life, I always learned to shoot low because you just never know when that buck's going to drop a little bit to load up their legs at the sound of the shot. And, you know, I've had, I've had whitetails drop, I bet, 15 inches at the sound of a shot. And you literally, if, if you don't aim low at the low heart, you know, that arrow whizzes right over their back. And, uh, and sometimes it still does no matter what. But so I always aim low, uh, that might be some target pack in there too, but so I always aim low <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the heart, and uh, he never he never saw it coming, never heard it, and it uh, it was pretty neat. It was it was one of those times when I really it would have made a great video because you know 
the, the shot went right where I wanted, and he bled out. You know, I, I'm shooting a new broadhead this year, the Iron Whale broadhead, and that thing. I mean, he. It was like garden hose off, you know, off two sides as I watched him, you know, run out 100 yards or 70 yards, and then just pile up. But there was. Uh, it made for easy deboning because there was no blood left in his body. Oh man, how cool! I. I live. For, I, I like all bow hunting and bow hunting all species, but there's something special to those high country mule deer early and in that velvet ah, like that. Just the country is. they live in. As you're telling the story, I can just picture that those rugged Colorado mountains that are you know shaped by rock up above and cliff bands, and then uh, you know in the those alpine basins where you get that grass growing on, and like that ditch you were in was was mm-hmm. off the snow melt uh, of you know the big yep. snowpack that was up above and how it melts down um i i can almost see the spot where you killed him even though i've never been there never seen it but that is so cool tony and and like um when, when they don't know you're there isn't that just the perfect scenario and i always sit like one of my favorite sayings hunting high country mule deer or hunting any mule deer is patience kills the buck and and i never throw stones i never try to get them up i sit and i wait just like you do in the baking sun ants crawling on you and that sun is intense when it's when you're 12, oh. 13,000 feet in Colorado, it'll burn you in the matter of a couple oh, hours. you got to keep all your skin covered. I know I've fried the, the backs of my hands and my face at times waiting on bucks, um, but that is so cool it panned out. And on yeah. just a, a giant bladed old mule deer, um, that is so cool. Yeah, no, it was. It, yeah, I, I feel the same way about the sun. Yeah, I, I, I man, I try to I try to stay out as much as I can, and it's uh. Yeah, the, the the high country mule deer hunts are, you know, that's, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a a tag that that took a ton of points for me just to be thinking about it all year long. I mean, over the counter type hunts are, you know, and these are high pressure hunts. There's there's people all over the place. I mean, I'm I'm, I mean, I'm running bumping into guys every day. Like I said, I mean, my number one buck, I found a picture of him on Instagram and had to had to make a detour and, um, in which by the way they didn't get him and. Uh, and actually, it's funny the the two guys that uh, their brothers um, they found uh, they were the ones that also found the buck that I went for the first day. They end up finding and getting a stock on that big buck uh, and and meeting those the the other brothers and their friends that found the, the you know my first buck. It was funny. It's like every guy I ran into knew about that buck by the end of the hunt, and no one got him. Um, and it's after I got my deer and switched out to elk. Uh, I think it was the first place I went into. So it would have been, uh, I took a day to, you know, I hiked, the, hiked the, the buck out on the second day. The third day I just, you know, I took care of the velvet. Did I do my old velvet prepper, you know, saving that with that, uh, the chemical stuff and all. I, you know, got all that stuff situated and then hiked in that night. That next day, so I guess it'd be the fourth day, hiked into an area. And sure enough, uh, it was it was only about a, mm, three quarters of a mile from where I'd found that big buck before the season. And he was all alone. I found him again, and uh, it was it was kind of it was kind of cool that I was in there after elk, and there was elk in there, and uh, and there he is all by himself in a spot that there's no way to glass him from a high spot. Uh, I was below him, uh, and yeah, it was he was in a very very killable spot though, um, and he was there the next morning and. Uh, I was up. I kind of went up the other side of the basin, uh, chasing some elk I'd seen, and uh, it was just about the time that I had made mistake probably 20 or 25 on uh, you know, for elk already that day, <laughs> and I and I had bumped that. I had bumped a little group of uh, bulls that had one solid six by in it that I was going to shoot if I had a chance, and uh, I'm just kind of sitting there regrouping, kind of thinking, well, I screwed that up. Um, and I'm looking over, and sure enough, my buck, you know, I was calling him my buck at that point. He's still laying over there. You know, he's three-quarters of a mile away on the other side of the base and tucked in some willows. And uh, just about that time, the sun was starting to hit his antlers, and I was just – I didn't have my spotter with me because I was, I was hunting elk. And, I'm, I'm, you know, and up there, when I'm hunting elk at 12,500 feet, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the gear as light as I can. So, if, you know, if I'm happy, I can, I can tell if an elk – I'm going to be happy with him with my binos. So I didn't have that with me, which I wish I did because I would have loved to get some more uh, – phone scope uh you know pictures and video of them but but as i'm sitting there watching them someone comes up over the the other side behind him and i got to watch a guy uh put a stock on him it was it was pretty cool um and he i I know the guy could see me because i'm standing out in the open on the other side and as soon as he i i 
at first I thought he's going to walk right into that buck and he's going to bump him out of there. And, and I'm almost rooting for the buck because I'm like, wait, no, my buck have just found a safe spot. He's going to be there next year, you know. And uh, and then I realized, oh, no, he knows exactly where that buck is. He came up on that on that ridge kind of that, on, the, on that uh, that side of the, of the basin, and I think he saw him in there. And uh, sure enough, he's, he gets – ridiculously close i mean this guy was 50 it looked like he was 15 yards away from him right above him and from from my you know from what i could see with my binoculars from that far away i think he had a long bore or recurve but he was not patient i mean within within a minute of standing there and he and he you know i saw him make like a you know he'd draw he'd draw and he, you know like he was just getting ready making sure he had room he starts reaching down and grabbing rocks and he's chucking rocks within a minute of, of being in position and i'm watching that buck he must have thrown a hundred rocks before that deer even turned his head. And, you know, and the rocks are getting bigger. And pretty soon I can see him in the air from the other side of the basin. He's throwing like baseballs sized rocks below this buck, like over, lobbing them over his head. And I'm sitting there thinking, just wait. You know, all you got to do is wait. Um, but eventually the buck did stand up and he shot. The buck bounded off kind of the direction the hunter came from and up over to the side and. You know, I scan and I'm watching that buck bounce away and I'm looking and I can see now now the side that is facing me is the side that was at that hunter and I don't see any blood and he bounces away just perfect and I about that time I I scan back to the hunter just in time to see the hat go in one direction and the bino harness comes off and gets tossed in another direction and the the recurve longbow whatever it was was already gone. I don't know where he chucked that. <laughs> but he was not happy. I mean this was a beautiful one ninety plus, you know, typical with a big six inch hook cheater i mean beautiful uh buck and you know i watched him go down there and look for blood and find his arrow and i saw i got you know i could you could just read the disappointment in him as, as he like just walked kind of the direction of the deer and you know he he, he definitely you know he found his arrow he looked for blood he followed you know for a couple hundred yards and that buck was fine he's gonna live and uh or unless someone gets him again, you know, or, or shot him. There's lots more seasons that happened after that, but he lived another day, and uh, yeah, it was it was pretty cool to see that see him though. Oh, that's wild! Patience kills the buck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and and I, you know, and who knows? Maybe uh, maybe the wind was swirling over there in a way that he just didn't feel comfortable, you know, waiting it out. I don't know, but uh, I sure would have, you know, I the first I remember just thinking, man. Just sit there, bud. It just don't don't push him. Just wait. But it all worked out. Well, well, and even on these high country hunts and elk hunts, and you know, you you run into guys, and you're there to uh, to get away from guys, and and it just seems like even in high pressure units, like I know the the unit I was in this year in Idaho, there was a bunch of guys in there, and and uh, one of the trails I was going up, you could take motorbikes up, and there was guys traveling mm-hmm. motorbikes, and I you know I. It seems like you can always find your own little piece of country to go hunt or your own deer to hunt that isn't bothered. And if you get into those high pressure units, like I just I just keep traveling country and I just keep looking for out of the way spots or spots that are tough to get to or maybe steep cliffs surrounding them. But it, it just seems like I can always find a little piece of country that I have to myself that I've got. You know, the deer to myself, the bucks that are in there, the elk that are in there, and, and animals also are trying to get away from humans. So a lot of times, you know, elk are where humans aren't. They've already find, yeah. found the spot where humans aren't getting to. So if you find elk, you pretty much got them to yourself, you know. But um, it, it just seems like even in those high-pressured units, and even this year where I was at, you know, there was guys hunting in there, and there was there was bucks around and bucks in there. But I was able to find my own couple drainages where I had to dive off and lose a thousand feet down this cliffy shale rock to get into these couple drainages in this ridge line that I had, you know, eight or ten basins off of it, and there was nobody hunting. And I found like my own little piece of country that I could hunt. And sometimes you find it by extra effort going farther back. Sometimes you find it by rugged country, or sometimes you just find a little spot that's overlooked or. Um, that you can't glass easily from a roadway or trail or a vantage point, and then that's your spot. But it, it just seems like you can always find your little piece of country to hunt. Do you find that as well? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Uh, you know, I've, I've hunted uh, Wyoming a couple times, uh, and uh, it's 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 it was eye opening to me to, to to figure out to realize how many uh, how many people in Wyoming have horses. Uh, <laughs> you can't you can't out hike a horse. 
And there's so many guys where I was hunting that that had horses. I you I couldn't get away from. Them. There was just no way. I mean, it didn't matter how far I hiked uh, or how far how many miles I put on my on my boots. I was gonna find people, and you just I had to start looking for little off the wall kind of places that were maybe really close to where they're at, but just just off the side, maybe a spot they're that they're riding past after maybe mile three or four or whatever, maybe maybe longer, but just maybe maybe not the highest concentration of animals, but there's yeah yeah you can always seem to find something some spot that you know no one else is looking into, and and who knows maybe that's where you're really gonna find that next level buck too. Well, and, and that's where you get that experience you're looking for, where it's you versus the deer. And, and yeah, in, in, in horse country, you can't outwalk the horses, but, mm. you know, how I always beat them is I always get in, in steeper, more rugged country that doesn't have trails and too cliffy for a horse, or the horses need water, and you kind of get away right. from water and get away from guys because the, the water is such a major deal, and it's so heavy that a lot of guys may hike to a spot that doesn't have water, but they can only survive there for that day or maybe you know the the day and a half that they have water and then they've got to go back down and get water and they don't feel like climbing back up where you know i'll i'll pack 10 pounds 12 pounds of water up there or i'll dive down and fill up my water and and climb back up and live up there on that top end but a lot of times that's where i'll find my little niche too is away from water steep rugged country but you're right there's there's always a little piece of country that's getting overlooked or it, it takes a bunch of effort to get into it's off trail it's something but there there's always that little slice of country and you're right that's usually where you find the the most mature bucks too they found that that yep. piece of country as well yeah yeah they've they, they found out how to get away from the majority of the hunters for sure they don't get old by uh by being seen so it's uh yeah, the uh, I, I you know I and and that's probably you know that's guys that get, I, I have friends and, and people ask me you know you know what's what's uh, what's what's the one advice you could, or you know, one thing you could say or you know, give uh, and it's you just gotta you can't kill them if they're not there it's it's kind of like you know me growing up in Michigan there was I mean there's probably only a couple bucks mature bucks per county I mean, you know there's just really i mean it's getting better now with antler you know, point restrictions and all that stuff but it, if they're not here you can't kill them um this you, you just got to be in areas where there's a chance and then you put in your time you put in your effort you find those little little niche spots but but sometimes you can do all the right things it doesn't matter if that if, if the area doesn't hold them well it doesn't matter how how well you you hunt it they're just not there so it's it's kind of a you know you, you got to be careful where you spend your time and that's it um well and yet like like i believe in my in my glassing and like i uh, I've heard guys talk, and even when in my younger days, I used to think there was this legend timber buck that'd be living yeah. in a basin <laughs> that you'd never see. You know, big deer do what small deer do. They come out and feed, and actually big deer have to feed more than small deer because that's yeah. how they grow those giant antlers. And so if you're not seeing them in that place, now that doesn't mean that you show up at some spot at noon and you don't see a giant buck. You keep looking because that's, you know, you got to be there at prime time at that morning and evening, and you don't always see them, you know, in, the, in your, your first time sitting on a vantage point sometimes it takes you know another evening or another morning before you've absolutely covered it but if you're not seeing them they're not there you know it's like yeah. i'll move on so i i trust my glass and i i trust the way i i move through country and my feel of country like if i'm not seeing what i'm looking for i just keep moving on and i keep searching and and my one tip to guys is is persistence like uh you just you just gotta keep going and keep searching and keep believing that you can make it happen uh that you just need to create this opportunity and so i i just keep in the grind i just you know if if they're not in this spot I'm thinking, of where am I going to go next? Am, am I on this ridge line and I'm going to go look at this next drainage? Or I, I'm going to go to this trailhead and I'm going to start over and I'm going to go into this next spot. But I, I'm always yep. thinking and theorizing uh, of what I'm going to do next and where I'm going to go. And that effort always seems to create an opportunity for me is just keep trying and keep thinking. And then when you do see something, try to transpose that 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 place that they're at and that elevation where they're at and try to look on your map and try to figure out another spot that faces that same direction and lays out that same and chances are the, the, that you'll find more bucks in in that spot you know but i just always just keep going just keep believing that i can kill something 
Yeah, no, I, you have to have that uh, confidence in yourself and confidence in your area, and yeah, without, you know, it's it's hard to stay mentally sharp uh, if if you don't, you know, because the first couple times you, that something goes wrong, it's if if you're not if you don't have it, you're gonna you're gonna be wanting wanting to pack up and, and head home to some comforts. And that cheeseburger is gonna sound way too good. Oh, and uh, stuff will go wrong on a on a oh, backcountry yeah. hunt and bow and arrow. <laughs> like like bad things are gonna happen. You like you plan all year for a hunt and you train and you picture how it's gonna go down. And then you get there and it always seems like it's tougher than you planned on. And then you mm-hmm. stack on a couple blown stocks on top of that, or a miss, or you know, uh, and it'll just take you to your lowest low. And like you say, all of a sudden that cheeseburger and that you know that <laughs> that going home sounds sounds pretty appealing. But you just can't let yourself do it. You just gotta yeah. you gotta pick yourself back up. And the the best way to get over a miss or get over a blown stock is is to get back to hunting and try to just learn from your mistake. If I if I make a miss, like um. I have such this drive to to find redemption and to make that shot that I know I could have made on that deer that I almost obsess about it and I almost I almost push harder after I've missed an animal or after I've made a mistake that I just want to get it right. I want that redemption. But but yeah, you you've always got to pick yourself up from those those lows of bow hunting because, you know, there there's sunshine on the other side of it. You just got to keep yeah. pushing. Oh yeah, yeah. That's like Colorado this year for me, I man. I I, I watched that earl seal over that buck's back, and I'm like, oh, they're they're, they're gone now. You know, it's a, you know, I already had game, you know, uh, several, you know, other plans ready to go. You know, I, earlier that day while I was sitting there waiting for him to stand up, I was classing around to other basins because things go wrong. You got to have a plan B. So I, those other bucks I found, if if I had just been focusing on that buck in that basin I was in and like put all my eggs in that basket, and I'm like, listen, it's, it's this buck or nothing, and uh, then. I might not have ever picked up those other bucks that were two and a half miles away, and I might not have seen them, and never would have went over there, and never would have got them. So yeah, uh, you gotta be, gotta be, gotta be, keep your eyes open and thinking ahead. Yeah, that glassing from afar too is so important. Like, um, you know, you glass all the surrounding basins and the one you're sitting on, but I, I never stop looking over the next hill or the next drainage or next ridge line. Like, I, I'm like you, where I'm always looking. Um, you know, I start small and then pretty soon I'm glassing two to four miles away just for for bodies that you can hardly judge. But at least then you know those deer in there and the country they like, and you you're just gaining more information that you can use towards the hunt. Yep, yep. And even or even if it's not deer, maybe you're seeing other hunters. Maybe you're figuring out, okay, well, there's that's where all those people that were at the trailhead are at. They're over there, and maybe they're not over there. You know, maybe I'm maybe I'm not seeing deer necessarily in a spot that looks really good, but maybe it's because I can't see the whole thing from here. But what I, what I don't see is anybody up on the high spots glassing. I don't see, you know, I don't see any tents. So, you know, yeah, all that stuff goes into into figuring out what, what the next move is when when something does go wrong. Oh, that's a really good thought. Yeah, I, I, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're you are taking in all information, looking for guys that are glassing and for tents, and um, yeah, where the people are. That's good information as well. Um, to to know what your next move is, but um, man, it's so cool. You've been so successful, and and uh, you, you've done all this. You know, living in Michigan and traveling out west, um, you you must uh, you must prepare like a madman, kind of like I do, to get ready for the west. I'm already preparing for next year. Uh, yeah, my girlfriend would tell you it doesn't really stop. It's it's it, it's uh, it's not a it's not a hobby. It's you know it's a lifestyle um, for me, anyways. It's 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 who I am, and it's not it's never going to go away. And you know. Um, my, I'm, I'm a carpenter, I'm a builder by trade, and that my customers know that uh, I'm not going to be there come August, uh, you know, middle of August, or beginning of August until you know the end of October, and sometime in October. Then come November, I'm gone again, and uh, you know they they understand, they 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 know, and um, of course I got good guys that, that watch my back here, you know, employees, great great guys, great great people, but it's uh it's just a commitment that I've made that. Um, as long as my knees can, and can, can take me up the hill and I'm going to keep going. And it's, it's, uh, it's what, it's what I live for. So it's man with you there. It is a lifestyle and it's, it's fun to put that much work into something and, and then have it pan out and find success. You know, I, I, I just love, 
you know, all the hard work and preparation of shooting your bow and being in good shape and, and map research and all this, this effort that goes into it. And then you kind of get your final exam when you get to Colorado or when you get on that hunt, and then it's, you know, it's going to test you and, and it, you know, it takes you to your limits a lot of times just being able to track up and down there and, and find deer and get stocks, but then to have it all come together uh, it's it's what I live for as well. It is it yeah. is. I haven't found anything in this life uh, like no. it, and I I just absolutely love it. So we're cut from the same cloth, Tony. That's yeah. that's so cool. And I I think it's important, like you set yourself up with your with your owners, and you set up your lifestyle to make sure that you have the time to go hunt. And I think oh, yeah. that's important. Instead of popping surprises on people, is like you let them know right away and up front how important this is to you and that you are going to be gone and that my guys are going to have to plan for this because you know this this is my passion in life and this is what I love to do and this is what I will be doing whether I I have your project or not so you know this is how it's going to be understand this or well, let's work around it or with it uh, otherwise it's not going to work out and I think that's for important for guys and you know a lot of guys don't have as as much time as you and I do but you you have to the time you do have you have to plan wisely and prepare your family and your work for it and and just make sure that that everybody's on the same page yep yeah you just gotta be honest with them and and say hey you know it's just gonna be gone (laughs) and if it's it's it might be hard on some relationships but uh i'm lucky enough to have a great lady at home and uh you know i've had to have talked with 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 customers uh more building homes to that you know basically lay it out that i'm climbing mountains I'm not getting any younger, and I've only got so many more years that I can do this. I mean, it's it's not a, you know, there's just only a certain number of seasons I'm ha- I have left, and you know, I, and I, I kind of explain it to them like that, and you know, it's it's kind of depressing when you think about it like that too. But you know, it it's opens their eyes, opens your eyes, you know, my eyes too. That once I once I say it that way, it's like, boy, I really better focus and put all my energy into this because. Who knows? Ten years from now, something could happen. You know, I'm, um, I mean, I've I've had a full ACL reconstruction in, in one of my knees, and uh, luckily it went fantastic, and I'm 100. percent But you know, who knows? You know, you could get in a car accident, and you might, you know, hurt, injure your legs to a point where you might not have that anymore. So you got to take advantage of every single time you go up there and, and really enjoy it for what it is. And for me, I got to learn to be more patient and take more pictures because those are my big faults but uh it's yeah you gotta you gotta enjoy it while you can oh isn't that the truth yeah well it's tough to take pictures when you're in the hunt like <laughs> oh, you're just enjoying the moment so much and and i've done good you know and you're a you're a writer as well and and uh but i've been writing for so long and i need so much content and now with the social media which is brand new to me i've been doing it about a year but it's really fun to be able to post up pictures of the hunt on there and be able to share kind of that that artsy side to, to other people that usually only my family and friends see or, you know, the pictures and articles. But, yeah, uh, I've gotten pretty good at taking pictures, but I can always take more. I can always do better, and, and uh, they sure are fun to look back on. But, yeah, those – you, you got to enjoy it while it's here. You don't know how many years you're going to be able to do it, but just like, like you're doing, like the – the, the better shape you keep yourself in, the, the healthier you are, the, the better your diet. You, you're just, uh, you're extending those years of enjoyment that you get to be up in those mountains and chase. And one of the, the main reasons that I try to take such good care of myself and try not to let stress overcome me or, you know, and, uh, mm-hmm. uh, try to, try to make sure to, to, to always be getting in my runs. And I'm like you, like, uh, hunting season ends and it's the day after I'm already on the trails and, and running, getting ready for next year. Because because the the better shape you're in, the the more you're gonna enjoy that hunt, and then the more years you have to hunt, you know, in the future. So it, it's just so important to take care of yourself, and it's nice that we have a passion that drives us to to want to be better. Yeah, yeah. I and I, you know, and I'm I'm not I'm not a guy that spends spends all kinds of time in the gym, and and I and I know plenty of guys that that aren't in you know gym shape that still kill lots of animals, but. I, the, the way I look at it is one longevity, like you say, you know, being able to hunt longer in my life, uh, it just, it's just a matter of truth. I mean, the, the longer I'm in shape, the more, the more years I can walk up a mountain. It's just simple facts, but, but also being able to take advantage of opportunities when they come. Um, you know, 
if maybe maybe you got enough energy to make three stocks a day. Maybe you've only got enough energy to make one stock a day where you're going up and down thousands of vertical feet. I don't want to ever have that, an opportunity present itself where I can't capitalize on it. I want to be able to say I can. my body is not going to hold me back, I guess is the best way to, to look at it. Oh, that's so true. Or you know, and it it makes a difference in your mindset on those tough hunts as well. Like you can yeah. glass a buck. A you know, I had this buck in Nevada, um, you know, a couple years ago, and I was with a couple buddies, and I glassed him up, and you know, he was miles across this giant drainage where you had to drop, you know, one of those ones where you got to drop twenty five hundred or three thousand vert, and then climb three thousand vert, go make your stock, and then return all the way back to try to make it to camp, miles and mm-hmm. miles, and so much elevation. And, you know, because I'm in such good shape and I train all year and he was a buck I wanted to kill, I actually went over there and missed him is what I did. But I uh, oh. but I went for it, you know. It was like yeah. it, I, I'm able to capitalize on that opportunity and I see this 200-inch deer that I want to kill and I'm, I'm going to go make a play. I'm going to go see yeah. what happens and, you know, I think I can kill this buck and – I ended up, it was another uh, rangefinder mishap. I uh, snuck into this buck and I had, there was two bucks there and they were bedded. And, and the one, you could see his horns, the one I wanted to shoot, you could see his horns and his head. You couldn't see his body. And then there was a tree that was sitting three to five yards behind him. And so I was ranging his velvet horns and getting the range, and I knew exactly what his what his range was. And so I dialed in. It wasn't that far of a shot, and then I just waited. And when he stood up, he had no idea I was there. But when he stood up, I had the range, and so I drew back and settled my pin and watched my arrow just sail right over his back. And and what had happened was, is my rangefinder wasn't picking up the velvet horns; it was picking up the tree behind him. So I got a range that was three to five yards farther than he actually was. Now, in hindsight, like the lesson I learned from that is be patient. He didn't know you were there. He could have stood up and you could have ate a sandwich range found a, yeah. <laughs> found him and, and shot him. You know, just have that patience to make sure you have a good range. And, and yeah. I didn't. I kind of rushed through the process or thought I had a good range on his velvet, stood up and I missed him. And then I had a, a super long walk back to camp. But uh, no regrets on that hunt because I was able to see him that far away and, and just trusted in my fitness and able to absolutely go for him and have one of the most thrilling encounters with a giant buck. And, and yeah, I missed him, but I learned a good lesson there and, and ended yeah. up killing one of my better bucks that, that year in another state. But um, yeah, the, being in that good shape and being able to capitalize, that's such a good point, Tony. Yeah. I've uh, A couple years ago, my best buck that I've taken in Colorado, uh, some other hunters blew him out of the basin. Uh, in the morning, very for opening morning, just walked right up. I don't even know what they're. Maybe they didn't even know it was there. I think they did because I, I thought I saw him glass in the same deer I was glassing the night before the opener. But blew him up. He takes off around, you know, kind of the ridge and of the of the mountain uh, that he's on, the basin. You know, he kind of went over the edge. And my only option was really to to relocate him was to was to go down the basin behind, you know, behind me and then back up the other side because that was, it was way higher. I mean, it was, you know, I don't know how many thousands of feet, but it took me all day to get, to go down and get up there. And, uh, I was able to locate him, uh, only because I went, I, 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 you know, basically walked away from a mile and a half, went the other way where I could actually see more. And, uh, and then as soon as I did, of course, I had to go back down and back up and, uh, the whole time those other hunters uh they had pretty much camped out right in that basin uh, i think they well they saw him run away and i think they were just they camped out thinking maybe he'd come back and maybe he would have um but they were set up in a spot where the thermals uh well but that was basically how i got him out of his bed um i didn't have to get him out of his bed uh, the thermals end up switching and he smelled those other hunters up above him and uh stood up and i was able to get an arrow through him but uh had i not been able to you know and had the, the confidence that i'm going to climb down from this, go all the way to the bottom and climb all the way up the other side, find them, then climb all the way back down, all the way back up over here and, uh, and make my stock. Uh, and you know, and there was no guarantee that he was even going to be there. Yeah, that was, that was just the only chance that I, that I, or the best, I should say the best chance that I thought I had of getting on him. So yeah, there's, there's definitely, uh, you know, being in shape helps that for sure. Yeah. Well- 
I always believe I can kill every deer I see too. Like I always think like I'm going to run over there and make it happen. And nine times out of 10 or, you know, four times out of five, it doesn't come together. But that one time it does just keeps my confidence high and just makes me think like any, any deer. And I learned the lesson the hard way. It's kind of a blessing and a curse, but every deer I see or every bull I see, I think I can kill, you know, and I always want to go for it and at least try. Yeah, that's that's within my motto too. I just need to find them. I just need to find them. If I can see them um, and I don't spook them, then I I know the odds are in my favor and I'm going to kill them eventually. But, um, yeah, it doesn't always work out, but it doesn't change my mind. I still think I can kill them every time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Well, Tony, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you and getting to know you. Check out Tony. Uh, you got a great Instagram page. I really like following that. Um, you find his writing in Eastman's and then Rock Slide. And Tony, you got to come back on and visit with me. I, I feel like oh, uh, sure. we're we're cut from the same cloth. It's really fun to visit with you. Yeah, I had a great time too. Any Anytime you want me on, just holler. All right. Sounds like a plan. Congrats again on your season. Uh, just a, another great season for you. Thanks, Brian. All right. We'll keep in touch. Sounds good. Talk to you later. All right, guys. That's a wrap. Um, Really fun episode with Tony. Like I say, just a, a consistent killer out, out west and uh, just prepares nonstop and just a, a lot to be learned from from what Tony's doing and, and how he's hunting. And so really fun to compare notes with him. Uh, make sure to go check him out on his Instagram and, and uh, uh, follow some of his articles like that recent one in, in Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal on that giant white tail he killed. Um, just really fun. Thanks to him for being on the podcast. Uh, sponsor for today's show is Matthews Bows. Again, shooting that new Tri-X. The guy's like, that thing is a shooter. I can't wait to update you on, on uh, how it's shooting. Like I, I've only spent a couple days with it here. I just got it set up the way I want and, and finally starting to fire some arrows out of it. But what a quiet bow and what a consistent shooter. Um, thing dang near shoots itself. But thanks to Matthews for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, check out Eastman's. Check out that gear guide. Going to go record those podcasts podcast with those guys and and catch up with everybody over there at the office so really looking forward to that and just getting prepared for uh this arizona coos hunt so uh gonna sit down and record a podcast with uh my buddy coulter on on hunting coos deer here and so we'll get that out to you guys but just a fun adventure in january where it's warm and you get to go immerse yourself in that desert landscape and so uh, really looking forward to it i'm gonna try to get this triax shooting so i can take that down there so working on that just run like a madman, like always. Um, you know, I, I think I've ran the last four or five day, four out of five days, um, running in the snow and running in the cold, and I love it. I just want to be in in really good shape and come into next season just absolutely swinging. I, I, uh, I, I want to hunt mule deer hard next year and elk hard and everything really, but. Um, it, it's just this uh, year-long pursuit to, to be successful in the mountains or to enjoy these experiences in the mountains. So really looking forward to it. Just going to keep putting in the work. Um, so I I got to change these endings on here. My wife told me I'm starting to drag on way too long on these endings, which she's right. Um, so, so uh, you know, and I always talk about the support. I just appreciate it so much, and I think I say it every episode to where it, it begins to – to sound rehearsed or or the same but i really do appreciate all the support and you guys reaching out to me so thanks for that and i i really appreciate you guys supporting our guests on here reaching out to them telling them you liked them on the podcast uh, liking their instagram page that goes so far for 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 me and and it just brings weight to the podcast that that these guys being guests on here is you're reaching a a hardcore audience of hunters out there and and they appreciate you being on and sharing information so i just wanted to thank you guys for for always supporting my guests on here and uh with that i better wrap this thing up so my wife doesn't yell at me this next time uh just joking she doesn't she doesn't yell at me but it it is good criticism to to go through and you know what and I, I learn from it and try to get better. So anyways, I better wrap this up. Uh, have a good week, guys. I'll check in with you guys next week.